everyone. Welcome to Church Online this weekend. If I've never met you, my name is Matt. I'm our Bayville campus pastor here um, at New Beginnings, and I'm excited to wrap up our Ready or Not. This is part two in a two-part series. And, you know, this is all about Jesus' return. The Bible is very clear. You know, Jesus, we know he died for us. He was buried. He rose again, and he's going to come again. He's going to come again soon. And last weekend, we began looking at the timing of Jesus' return and the signs that point to that around us. And, you know, just like when you're on the highway, there's signs that are pointing you to your destination, right? I know for me, if I'm taking the parkway home, I know the sign of the exit that I get off of to get to my house, right? Signs on the highway, they'll point us, right? You're looking for a rest stop, you'll see a sign and it will tell you whatever rest stop is so many miles away or this many more miles till the next one whatever it may be. And Jesus has given us signs that he is returning soon, that he's coming soon. We don't know the day, the time, the place, or the hour. That's not really our business to know. That's God's business. Jesus made it clear God knows the day, the time, the place, and the hour, and it will be the perfect time because he is God, and he knows what is the perfect time. Our job is to be alert, to be ready, to be expectant. Amen. And we looked at two major signs that have happened that, that show us his return is near. We could say we're in the end days. Number one is Israel was made a nation in 1948. Israel had to be in Jewish control in order for Jesus to return. The state of Israel was declared to be a sovereign nation on May 14, 1948. And within minutes, President Truman, a Bible-believing Christian, recognized the nation of Israel, and by that afternoon, all their enemies attacked them on all sides. <clears throat> Number two, uh, Jerusalem was recaptured and reunited with the rest of Israel in 1967, and history tells us that in AD 70, Jerusalem was captured by the Romans and the temple destroyed. And let's see what Jesus, what did Jesus say about this? Well, in Luke 21, 24, it says, And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles in the t until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. In other words, Jesus, what he was saying is, Hey, when you see Jerusalem won back, time is up. Time is up. Luke 21, 31, in the same way, Jesus said, When you see all these things taking place, you can know that the kingdom of God is is near amen the kingdom of god is near so as believers well what should we be looking for next and jesus gave us a hint of this at the last supper when he was talking to his disciples at the last supper and he knew this is the last supper it's not a surprise to jesus he's going to talk about important stuff and in john 14 he says in my father's house there are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you I go, Jesus says, to prepare, to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Many times we may hear this scripture at a funeral, suggesting that Jesus meant we, we would be united with him in death. And we will, but there is a deeper meaning there. As we discussed a few weeks ago, this is wedding language. The tradition in this time would be the groom. In Jesus' time, the groom would go to his father's house and ask to marry the daughter. Upon agreement, the father would then set about building a honeymoon suite for the couple. One day, the father would say to his son, Okay, your room is ready. Go get your bride. And during the time the room was being built, the bride was to be continually preparing for her groom to come for her the church we are the bride of christ the church that's who we are and the church should be preparing for the groom to come for his bride again it's not our business we don't need to know the day the time the, we know the place where he's going to return or the hour he's going to return the same place he went up he ascended um, but our job is to be expectant to be expectant, to live our lives every day with an expectancy that Jesus could come back today. Amen. And now let's look at Paul's introduction to the rapture of the rapture, the return of Jesus for the church. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, Paul writes, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. 
then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. And he says, so encourage each other with these words. This is the rapture. It's the catching away of the church before all hell breaks loose here on the earth. And there are biblical examples of the raptures. Hebrews 11.5, it was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven. A rapture. Without dying, he disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. The Bible says that Enoch departed right before the flood, before the disaster hit. And then in 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah was taken to heaven alive. We see that. Elijah, Elijah was taken to heaven alive. Biblical examples of rapture. They didn't die here on this earth. They were taken up. You know, Jesus, again, ascended into heaven in his resurrected body after he rose from the dead. In the place where he ascended. That's where he will see someone he comes back. But Acts chapter 1. Let's go to verse 8. Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven. Someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. They say Jesus is coming back. They witness Jesus ascending bodily in bodily form. And he will return the same way and at the same location. Jesus warned of a time of great suffering, punishment, and chaos coming upon the earth. Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. Tribulation, what's that? Great affliction, trial, or distress, suffering, an experience that is hard to bear. You know, the word tribulation is from the Greek word philipsis, which can be translated the king tribulation 21 x's, affliction 21 times, affliction 17 times, trouble 3 times. So now we talk about part 2 again this week. How is the church, how are we affected by this? Well, the Great Tribulation, what's that going to be? Unpresented, there's going to be unpresented diseases, worldwide famine, a massive earthquake, asteroids crashing into the earth, one third of all planet life destroyed, as much as 50% of the population dies. Christians will be martyred for their faith. You're thinking, well, after Jesus returns, Christians will be martyred for their faith. Yeah, because people will still have an opportunity during that time, during those seven years. People are going to have an opportunity still to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I, you know, I would believe, you know, that there's people that somebody maybe shared the gospel and they may have denied it and not believed it. And then the rapture happens and they notice, wow, those people maybe that told me they're not here anymore. They can come to realize that Jesus is Lord. People will still be able to get saved during that time. And the question we deal with now, again, is what will believers, um, will believers experience this in part two? Will believers experience this? Well, Jesus compared the second coming to the days of Lot and the days of Noah. And notice what the angel told Lot, okay? In Genesis 19, 15 to 24, it says, At dawn the next morning, the angels became insistent. Hurry, they said to Lot. Take your wife and your two daughters who are here. Get out right now or you will be swept away in the destruction of the city. When Lot still hesitated, the angel seized his hand and the hands of his wife and two daughters and rushed them to uh, safety outside the city. For the Lord was merciful. The Lord was merciful. When they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered, Run for your lives and don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. Oh no, my Lord, Lot begged. You have been so gracious to me and saved my life and you have shown such great kindness. But I cannot go to the mountains. Disasters would catch up to me there and I would soon die. See, there is a small village nearby. Please let me go there instead. Don't you see how small it is? Then my life will be saved. All right, the angel said, I will grant your request. I will not destroy the little village, but hurry, escape to it, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Lot reached the village just as the sun was rising over the horizon, and then the Lord rained down fire and burning sulfur from the sky on Sodom and Gomorrah. And the angel told Lot that he could do nothing until the righteous departed. Noah and his family also, going to Noah and his family, they rode 
they wrote above the storm, the flood. The rain, it was a type of tribulation of the flood, a type of tribulation that could not begin until they were all safe in the ark. And think about Enoch walking with God out of here and out of here just before the flood of Noah. Enoch got taken away right before the flood. And how exciting and wonderful will it be that God is going to evacuate us because of what's getting ready to happen on the earth during that time. Romans chapter 5, verse 9, and much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 to 11, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The true end of the return of Jesus is that Christians living or dead should live together with him, live together with him and always be with the Lord. And, and honestly, such knowledge gives true comfort. And on the other hand, evil is going to be forever banished from the presence of the Lord. And, and Paul shares more detailed information and really in Revelation with us. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-3, through 3, Paul says, Now, brethren, concern, concerning the coming of our Lord, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Two distinct events we can notice here. The coming of the Lord refers to the second coming, and our gathering together to him refers to the rapture. And, you know, it's again, the second, second Thessalonians 2, 3, a falling away. The Greek word there is apostasia or the apostasy, and there's a difference between apostasy and apostasia. We usually define apostasy to mean departing from the faith. However, apostasia is the exact word used when Enoch departed before the flood, and it means departing as in an exit, a goodbye. If apostasy meant departing from the faith, then the Antichrist would have come, would have come during the dark ages before the resurrection. And the Apostle Paul is saying God must take the church off the earth so the Antichrist can come on the scene. Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verses 7-8 through eight. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. The church is holding him back. Right now we are holding evil back. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will slay him with his breath, with the breath of his mouth, and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. Amen. So we see that according to the major signs Jesus gave, Israel and Jerusalem restored under Jewish control. We are in the time right now of Jesus is appearing. It can happen at any time. So then we as the church, what then should the church, should every believer be doing? Well, number one, every believer, if you're a believer of the Lord Jesus, what should we be doing during this time? To make sure that you're ready, excited about his coming back, like a bride for her groom. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart for sin, for salvation. Jesus appeared on earth to accomplish his atoning work. Then he entered into heaven, opening the way of access to God. One day he will reappear to consummate our salvation. Amen. Number two. This is an important one. Make sure that your loved ones are ready. Introduce them to Jesus. Tell them about the Lord Jesus. He could come back any day. Make sure they know about Jesus. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. A positive explanation of the temporary lack of fulfillment is found in the character of a merciful God. Although the wickedness of humankind calls for immediate action, God withholds his righteous wrath and delays judgment. Again, two things. Make sure you're ready. Be excited, expectant, like a groom coming for his, uh, like a groom coming for the bride. And then make sure your loved ones know about the Lord Jesus. Your co-workers know about the Lord Jesus. Your friends know about the Lord Jesus. 
We are in the last days. We don't know when that day will be. And again, it's not our business to know. It's our business to do the Lord's work each and every day we're here. What I want to do is, first I want, well, secondly, I want to pray for all of our unsaved loved ones out there, that God would open a door. But before that, I want to make sure I extend this prayer. If you're watching this or listening to it, whatever you may be doing, and you've not received the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you would have an opportunity to go ahead and do that. So wherever you are, I'm going to lead us into this salvation prayer that the Apostle Paul talked about in Romans 10. He says, qualifications for salvation, what is that? Well, he says, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you believe that he went to the cross to die for your sins, you believe that he died for you and rose again, he says, when we believe that with our hearts, we confess that with our mouths, salvation has come. So I'm going to lead us into salvation prayer. You can pray this with me. I know if you're praying this for the first time, you literally become a new creation in Christ. Amen. So let's go ahead and pray this. Father, I believe that Jesus is your son. And I believe that he went to the cross for my sins, that he died for my sins, and that he rose again. So Father, this day, I acknowledge that I need a savior. I repent of my own ways. And Jesus, I ask you to come into my life, to be my Lord, and to be my Savior. I surrender my life to you, and I'm going to follow you all of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, church. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, please let us know in the description below. We would love to reach out to you. This is the beginning of your journey with Jesus. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. Amen. And I want to go ahead. I want to pray for all of our unsaved loved ones now so you could join me in faith in this. Father, I just thank you for each and every person watching this, Lord. I thank you, Lord. We all have people in our lives that don't know Jesus. And Father, that you would open doors for us to speak the gospel to them. If they don't live in the same state as us, Lord, maybe it's a text, a phone call, or Father, you bring somebody along their path to tell them about Jesus. And I pray that they would have open hearts, that whatever the enemy has been blinding them from, we break that right now in the name of Jesus. We break those blinders off. We cast those blinders off in Jesus' name. So, Father, we thank you for those loved ones' salvation, Lord God. Thank you they're going to come to know Jesus as their personal Lord and as their personal Savior, Father. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, amen, church. Listen, God bless you. We love you, and we will see you next weekend.